and welcome to another edition of Montpelier Connection. I'm State Representative Mike Merwicki from the Wyndham Four District of Putney, Dummerston, and Westminster. And I'm here today with Senator Becca Ballant. Welcome to me. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> Thanks um, for coming. <laughs> we have finished with the 2019 legislative mm -hmm. session. Uh, so we've been having mm -hmm. this series of interviews to kind of rehash <laughs> what went on and then maybe take a peek of uh, what went on. Uh, overall impressions, I feel like we did a lot. Exactly. Got a That's lot done. Got a and lot your done. sense? Same thing, Mike. I was sitting down this morning thinking about just how much we were able to get done across the aisle, both chambers really working together. Very long list of, of accomplishments. And the one that I know we both are, are keenly interested in talking about um, some today is the issue of reproductive rights here in yeah. Vermont, because we both have heard from colleagues around the nation who are so, so grateful for the work that we were able mm -hmm. to do here in yeah. the state. I, I was recently at a, a, a national conference uh, of, of progressive legislators in D.C. And, and I heard from people in Georgia, Ohio, um, Tennessee saying thank you yeah. uh, because we want that, somebody to hold that light up there That's to know right. we can do that. Yeah, it's a light of hope and it's also a very clear statement that we made that we trust women and their families to be making decisions yeah. about their own body. And that, as I've said before, that should not be a radical idea, yeah. but it feels radical to have to say that. Yeah. And, and it's not a government decision. Exactly. Government has no business in this decision. Well, that's it. And I, I brought that up several times on the floor of the Senate when we were debating um, both the bills in my chamber, which is, I am not a doctor. I should not be weighing in on people's healthcare decisions in this way. And so, so proud of that work that we did. It was not unlike what many people thought. It was not an easy conversation to have here yeah. in Vermont. There are still um, a lot of very strong feelings about it um, religiously. But what we know from looking at um, national statistics is regardless of political affiliation, there are either majorities or pluralities within religious denominations that believe the government should stay out of reproductive health care decisions. Yeah. So. Uh, recent news, though, is in the same vein. Uh, mm -hmm. Title X funding is uh, at risk, right. and this affects Vermont. Absolutely. Um, there were some discussions last year, right. some preliminary discussions, as. Right as to whether we can backfill that funding. Right. And uh, any thoughts on that? Well, I think there's a strong sense within the legislature that we do need to try to find a way to backfill that, that we do not want people to be making choices that are not in their best health interests or the interests of their family because they don't have access to the reproductive health that they need and deserve. And so we're going to have to make some important choices about funding, but I think yeah. that there is strong support for that. Yeah. Well, I hope we can reassure uh, the many women out there that depend on this. Absolutely. Thousands. Absolutely. Yeah. And it is, it was interesting. You and I were both at um, that uh, event for Planned Parenthood a few weeks ago. And I stayed afterwards to talk to a bunch of folks. And many of us, our very first reproductive health uh, examinations and care that we got were through our local Planned Parenthood yeah. affiliate. And that's true for so many women around the yeah. state. Yeah. For, for my daughters who are yeah. now in their 30s yeah. uh, but when the time came it was let's go to Planned Parenthood start a relationship right. start to get your exams know what you need to do as you exactly. get older and get real information you get real information right yeah so and and you know my daughter just had her first child at I 37 know. Wait, and congratulations sh she was ready to have it this right. is what family planning is about that's right uh, and and this is why family planning is, is so important and, and as you know, Mike, and you're actually a great champion of this, is for us to really talk honestly and openly about these issues. Yeah. It does no good for us to have whispered conversations about women's reproductive health. Yeah. And so I really appreciate that about you as a male ally in this work, that I can always count on you, that you're going to be standing up for, for all the women of this county. Yeah. And, and it is critical that we have those allies. Yeah. Well, yeah. thanks. Yeah. And thank you for all your work. Uh, on this and and for Vermont we, yeah. we are leaders on this we really are and I I want to give a shout out to uh, Senator Lyons mm -hmm. um, she is a senator from Chittenden County and she was really the one that that said to us um, last summer the group of us on the the Senate leadership team she said we're obviously going to support 
the work that the House is going to do going forward on the, the, the standalone bill on reproductive health. And she said, I really want to make sure that we are moving forward on a, a constitutional sure. amendment that, that really supports reproductive liberty for all Vermonters, yeah. male and female. And so that that's not an easy thing to undertake. And I thought she did a, a wonderful job. Yeah, we, we yeah. have talked about this with other guests, but just uh, to highlight what the two-pronged plan is right. in Vermont. So, so H57, which was, and I just, I have to give an incredible uh, shout out to to your leadership team as well, mm -hmm. um, Joe Kerensky, Mitzi Johnson, and um, oh, Emily Long. The three of them worked so so closely to make sure that you in the House were ready for these really difficult mm -hmm. conversations, and so and put together an incredible vote. Absolutely, such a Two strong vote. Two weeks before vote. the vote, we were wondering if he had the votes, and then we wound up with with 106 votes. I think. And you stood so strong on all the um, the attempts yeah. at floor amendments, and yeah. it was just one after another. And and again, you fought people with the facts. Yeah. It was this is not a real thing that you're talking about. And yeah. so we felt really buoyed by <laughs> your uh, work in the House. And so when we undertook the constitutional amendment, it was this is um, this is something to protect our our rights long term if for some reason we have a governor that comes in a legislature that changes his focus in the future and can change the statutory language we want to make sure that we have it enshrined and the beauty of it is it goes to the voters yeah and it goes to another legislature right yeah. so we will pass it um this this session it will be passed out to the next legislature and they have to also weigh in and then it goes to the voters and i'm really hoping that the voters of Vermont will understand that it is not our um, role as citizens or as legislatures to weigh in on people's f private decisions about reproductive health. Yeah. So that is my hope. Yeah. And basically, H57 only puts into statute what was Exactly. Practice. Thank you for that clarification. It codifies what we have already been doing. Yeah. And that is what was so disheartening about the conversations as it took shape uh, among some, some of the religious leaders in Vermont. We felt like early on there was um, some, some hysterical, um, I don't want to call it news because it wasn't news, uh, but uh, news alerts for their, for their members in their churches. And it was, it was full of misinformation. What we were doing was codifying what was already in place and as it should be. And some people said, well, why codify it if we've never had a problem? We say Kavanaugh has yeah. been placed on the Supreme sure. Court and the landscape has changed dramatically yeah. and we cannot stick our hand, heads in the sand and pretend that that's not true. Yeah. There are already challenges working their way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. We have to be proactive yeah. in saying we believe in women and their ability to make their own decisions. And we believe in families. Yeah. It's really what it's about. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, thank you. Um, so, another concern that has come up, yeah. uh, or that we have worked on, right. and uh, continue to, and will continue to, is the, the idea that we need to continue to work on cleaning up the environment right. and, and recognizing climate change. Right. Um, now, in Vermont, going back to when Peter Shumlin was governor, he made this a, a top priority. Absolutely. Um, he brought Bill McKibben in to mm. talk to the legislature mm -hmm. and started the ball rolling. So what we're doing in Vermont now is so far ahead of what other states are doing. Not that we don't have to do more, but n not many states have the main electric producer who has a 90% green portfolio. Right. Uh, last year we put $160 million of climate actions into the budget. Right. Um, what do you think are next steps as we move forward for next year? Because this is not an easy problem. It's an ongoing problem. It, it is. And I'm feeling much more hopeful about our ability in the legislature to get um, some climate action policy forward. And I'll tell you why. We, uh, in the days after the session wrapped, the Climate Solutions Caucus met off-site, big retreat, many House members and senators there uh, at the end of May. And we said, okay, 
We all have passion and drive and commitment, and yet our efforts are so diffuse. Yeah. And we have to be better about naming, you know, sort of a punch list. These are the things we're going to try to get done in the upcoming session. And in order to do that, we need to break up into subgroups because what's happening, as, as I'm sure you well know, we come as citizen legislators to this building and we have our own um, ideas about what needs to happen. But when you get 75 people in a room who all care about climate change, but they care about different aspects of how to attack it, in the end, we don't get as much done as we want. So, so we met and we broke up into uh, four subgroups one uh, on green economy and renewable energy, one on transportation, which I serve on the subgroup along with Molly Burke, yep. um, one on building energy and thermal efficiency, so important to so many of our builders here. And the last one, which was on communicating and messaging, that we're not doing a great job of telling the story yeah. to Vermonters at large about why we, we need to care about climate change. And so those subgroups are working in the off season, which we'll talk about later, uh, yeah. perhaps in this interview on what the off season really means these days. Um, and we're gonna come back with concrete um, suggestions for you know, both to the pro tem and to uh, the house leadership yeah. to say, this is where the caucus would like to go. Yeah. And um, we also had a very strong group of house and Senate members who uh, supported the Vermont Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, the number in the, the Senate was S-173. I'm not sure what the companion bill was in the yeah. House. But we will, once again, really be pushing to take that up because it's not enough to have um, recommendations or suggestions for how we're going to get some that where we, we actually need some teeth in it to say if we're going to reduce carbon emissions, these yeah. are the things we need to do. So feeling really hopeful about that. But I want to remind folks what we did do, which I think got lost in sort of the drama of the end game. Um, we passed um, a very strong bill on hydrofluorocarbons, um, highly potent greenhouse gases. We, as you mentioned, in lots, millions of dollars in investments, a lot of it in weatherization. We know that one of the strongest um, challenges for us is in home heating fuel. That's where a lot of our carbon footprint is. The other, of course, in transportation. And so uh, investments in electric vehicles for, for more state workers, expanding the infrastructure for charging stations, and trying to expand the program for e-vehicles to lower income folks so they actually can afford these vehicles. And then one that I don't know a lot about, but I'm eager to learn is on the, the forest preservation, doing carbon sequestration. And again, some things that are lower down on the radar screen that people aren't necessarily tuned into, sure. but many, Many of the committees have a lens to climate change and what we're going to do about it. And so, although we will always, there will always be more to do. Yeah. And I know some, um, some of my friends in the advocacy community were disappointed that we really didn't get more done in the first year of the biennium. There's another year, and the Climate Solutions Caucus is much more organized this time. So yeah. I, I'm feeling hopeful. Yeah. And, and I think we need to stay hopeful because when we let despondency take over, then that's what leads to inaction. There's great opportunities here. Absolutely. Both environmental and economic. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, so. and, and another um, topic I know we were interested in talking about, and again, might not at first blush seem to relate to climate change, but absolutely does, is the issue of the broadband bill. Yeah. That we would like people to work more remotely yeah. several days a week. We would like there to be an opportunity for people not to be on the roads all the time. And we know that is a huge challenge for us in Vermont. We yeah. don't have a lot of viable mass transit. Yeah. And so one way to engineer that is to say, let's get towns that help that they need to build out the broadband. So yeah. that is what we see as a critical component of the climate discussion yeah and and there will be uh, an event in september coming yes up. yes i'm so glad you uh, mentioned it it is a it is going to going to be make sure i get you the right date september 13th and the um windham regional commission i believe is going to be hosting it yeah and it is such an exciting thing to finally have somebody at the public service department who's going to be sort of the point person for yeah. helping towns to implement their vision. So sure. there's there's funding available, but there's also technical assistance because yeah. that's where a lot of it broke down. So yeah. in the same way,
that I'm feeling hopeful about the climate change discussion, this broadband bill is not, it's not gonna fix all of our connectivity yeah. issues, but it's finally acknowledging if the providers that we have were going to connect these rural areas, it already would have been done. So yeah. can we just admit that and get a different model in place? Yeah. And so. quite frankly, the free market has failed us here. Yes, it is. The, the, we, so the government has to step in. Absolutely, I believe that most sincerely because these rural areas need, yeah. not just for the economy, but for their schools, for safety. Absolutely, for safety. It was a big yeah. one out in yeah. um, our, our colleague Laura Sebelius district. Yeah. And so I feel like people are getting, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, I think they're getting to the point of saying government is the solution, you know, it's the yeah. solution in this. It's not government. We're here to help. <laughs> we're here to help. Like, we're really here to help. And, yeah. and, the, and, and the private sector yeah. has not been able to do it no. because of the, our population yeah. is so yeah. um, dispersed. And, and we and have so, a model for how these municipal utilities can work with yeah, EC Fiber. Absolutely, and which, Kingdom Fiber, there's, yeah. a, there's a bunch of groups yeah. around the state who have really taken matters in their own yeah. hands and we can use those as models. Yeah. So it's so very exciting. It, it is exciting and, yeah. and I know people that have been waiting a long yes. time for this and, and I think this is some of the best hope we have to yes. hold up for them. Yeah. So, and you're right, uh, if we want people driving less, yeah. this is one way that work can happen. So, Absolutely. Um, and the other piece that I think, again, that people may not realize connects to this issue of broadband is we have an aging population in Wyndham County. Many more people taking advantage of telemedicine. Yeah. They can't get to, a, you know, whether it's a, psycholo you know, a psychology specialist yeah. or somebody to, to give a consult. Telemedicine needs good connectivity as well. Yep. So, yeah. yeah. And the concerns of economic development and growth yeah. go hand in hand with this, because this is, I think, one of those factors or barriers yes. for, for economic growth. And this is something that you've been in, involved in for a while now. And, yeah. Um, what are we, where's the direction we're heading? Because yeah. Vermont's economy is a concern. Sure. So what I've seen, and you and I were talking about this a little bit earlier, what I really see is the nexus for, for economic development and for our, our population demographic issues is the issue of housing. And it is a huge issue for most parts of the state. And it was interesting, I was just talking to our colleague, Emily Kornheiser yesterday about how Chittenden County always gets the press on how tight the housing market is. We have a tighter housing market in Wyndham County. We do. We do. And it is, it's not particular Vermont, but we have uh, a real problem here. And I think many people are coming around to that, but there's still work that we need to do to let folks know that if you don't have the housing at all levels, from modest income to middle income, um, you are going to have a problem with your economy because there's nowhere for the workers to live. And that is yeah. a serious concern. And so right now, I'll make sure I get the right um, figure here. Right now, over 60% of low-income Vermonters will not be able to secure decent, affordable housing in Vermont. 60% because yeah. we simply don't have the units. Yeah. And if you're in the market to buy, it's not much better. Yeah. Most of the units being built right now, again, not just in Vermont, but statewide, oh, excuse me, uh, nationwide, are at the high end. It's yeah. a great time to be a rich person looking for a home. Yes. It is not great for everybody else. Yeah. And I know these are difficult conversations to have in many communities, but I am telling you, throughout this county, we have a housing crisis. Yeah. And we need communities to acknowledge that because it is, the future of our rural economies, and it's also the future of our schools. Yeah, Absolutely. You bet. And so it, I, it, yeah. What we're finding, we're, we're seeing this already. I've had people call me and say, tell me where I find an electrician. Yeah. Tell me where I can find a plumber. People are retiring. They are. Medical providers, Absolutely. dentists, specialists. Yes. They're retiring. We don't have people coming in. No, there's nowhere in the pipeline. The yeah. housing shortage yeah. contributes to all of this. It's a barrier to our economic growth. It's absolutely true. And, and it is, it's been interesting personally. So we, uh, my spouse and I live on South Main Street. And we have a very small lot. And um, great house. We love the house. We always say if we could move the house 
to just a little bit bigger uh, yard, it would be easier for the dog and for my very two rambunctious children. We've been looking and looking and looking, and there is nothing in the range yeah. for, for us. And it's not only frustrating for us, we want a little bit bigger house, it's a little bit more expensive, not available. Yeah. We could spend a lot more money for a lot more house we don't need, but we're taking up a house that another family could yep. use as, a, as, as what we say a starter home, but I kind of don't like that term because you could stay in your starter home your whole life and that would be fine, yep. right? But a modest home and it is to, to have been looking for a year and a half and we finally just admitted we're not gonna find it. And so I had a contractor come yesterday to look at a, a, a crawl space in the attic, like could we turn this into another room? And so that decision is happening all over this county. Yeah. And many uh, seniors who'd like to either age in place or move to another home that's all one floor. Or move to the village. Exactly. From the mountain so top. It's, so it's walkable. Yeah. And so it impacts all of, of those uh, segments of the population. And I feel like the conversation is still too much based in fear. Mm -hmm. Fear of the too many people moving in. There's going to be too many people draining the system. There is no danger of that. Yeah. We, we are losing people, there is no danger of that. And yeah. so we, what we need are decent, affordable rentals sure. and, and homes for people to live in. And that's good for all of us. Yeah. It's good for communities. I yeah. can talk to my two adult daughters who are now in Massachusetts, because yeah. when they were ready to start out, there just wasn't affordable housing here. That's right. You know, and now they're on either end of Massachusetts. Yeah. And uh, I wish they would Right. Maybe someday be back in Vermont, but it's a barrier. So. It is a barrier. And the other piece that is connected is the, and I know we don't have uh, too much time to discuss it, but the issue of the amount of student debt that, that yeah. folks are carrying. That is also a barrier. It sure is. Um, yeah. Matt Dunn's group out of um, Hart, Hartland, Hartford, hmm, Hartland, Vermont. Who they also have a, a one in, in Springfield. Yep. They did some research. What are the barriers for people moving to rural areas? One of yeah. the biggest ones is cannot afford to pay my student loan debt because the amount I'm going to make in yeah. Vermont in a rural area and the amount the housing is going to cost me, yep. I can't stay ahead of the payments. Yeah. So they're going to stay in the Boston or New York area even though they don't want to be there yeah. because of that additional burden. Yeah. And, and luckily, the this is part of the national conversation now. Absolutely. And as we move towards what I think is a consensus about uh, debt-free college. Right. The fact that if you n need help with college, you shouldn't be burdened with, with the level of debt that people have. Right. You should be able to refinance those loans. Right. Uh, and and the, the, the rules are really stacked against people getting ahead on this now. Oh, absolutely. Um, it, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it was one of the things I mentioned quite a bit when I was first in the legislature uh, and on the, my housing committee is trying to convey to people that I was um, someone who had a college degree, I had, a, I had a graduate degree, I had a good job, I was working in the school system, I had good yeah. benefits, and even so, I couldn't buy my first home until I was almost 39 yeah. because I didn't have the down payment and I didn't have the closing costs. And, and for the, me to be able to say to them, but I'm a Gen Xer. I'm not carrying the debt that the millennials. I oh, can't imagine. Right? And so, but you have to make it real in that way because yeah. people are like, well, I paid off my debt. It's like the debt that you had is nothing compared to what yeah. these young people are carrying. And it, it impacts settlement pow p patterns. It impacts choices that they're making around families. And I feel like we, we owe them better. Mm -hmm. I absolutely believe that. Yeah. This is yeah. the future. Absolutely, yeah. and and let's we want. Let's in the future. Let's do, and let's make Vermont a place where people feel like they can come yeah. here and build a family and build a yeah. life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a lot to offer here. Oh, I love it and, here. And uh, it's not going to just happen for us to continue that way. Right. We need to make those investments, as in any part of our Absolutely. lives. Absolutely. We, what we invest in, will grow. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple minutes yeah. left. Um, a question about your experience yeah. in the legislature. Uh, you're heading into your... Uh, sixth year. Yes, yeah, so it'll be my sixth, sixth year. year. Yeah. Um, before you came into the legislature, I'm sure you had an idea right. of what it might be. Right. And here it is, the reality of it. Right. Can you share a little bit about 
the differences in that experience? Yeah. Do you, you know, remember what it was, you thought it might be like? Well, I have to tell you a quick, a quick story. I had so much anxiety about starting mm -hmm. that in the weeks before the, my first legislative session, I had this <laughs> recurring nightmare that not only was I going to have to serve in the legislature, but I was going to have to serve in the judiciary at the same time. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was like this okay. level of anxiety. Couldn't find a place. Speaking of housing, in yeah. my dream, I couldn't find a place to live. And I got there and I felt like I don't know anything. Yeah. And so that, I definitely had this fear of not being able to do the job well. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people feel that way with a new, new experience. Mm -hmm. I thought there would be more, I thought there'd be more support mm -hmm. in terms of um, folks, legislators all over the country have staff that help them do their job. And yeah. just to be clear, here in Vermont, we do not, we have a wonderful team of lawyers on legislative council. Who, who write the actual bills. That, that draft all the bills yeah. for us, who are incredibly overworked and I just want to tell folks at home that you may not know this, but at some point this session, we were told by legislative council, do not send us any more bills yeah. because we are flat out. We yeah. don't have enough capacity. And so that's a structural problem, yeah. right? And so you've got constituents that want you to introduce their bill and you say, I can't get a drafter. Okay. Yeah. So I thought there would be more a uh, healthier infrastructure. Yeah. I didn't realize the extent to which the job really is full time, full time, but reimbursed part time. Yeah. And you know, it's it's hard for me to say that because I don't want to be seen as a complainer mm -hmm. because I love my job and I'm lucky yeah. to have it. And every day I walk in that building and I'm so proud to have it. But now when we come home from the session, people say, "Oh, it must be so great to like." You know, how's your break? <laughs> how's your break? And I always laugh. I said, "Oh my gosh, if you saw my, if you saw my email inbox or my voicemail yeah. or the number of trips we've all made back yeah. and forth still to, to Montpelier and meeting with constituents, it never ends. And that has gotten worse. I feel like over the last few yeah. years, and especially since Trump was elected, yeah, because there's this level of fear and anxiety, and then there is." Um, the real effects of those policies, yeah. right? So the need is you great can. and you can't say no to people, no. right? I can't, I know you can't either. And so you make it work somehow, whether you're meeting on the weekends or taking calls early in the morning or late at night. And so I guess that's what I want people to know is yeah. that there's often a lot of fury at us, whether it's through emails or someone stopping me on the street, you know, why didn't you and your legislative mm -hmm. colleagues do this right? Why didn't you do that right? And I always try to remind them, we are a citizen legislature. We do our work without staff yeah. and we do the best we can. And we certainly make mistakes, but we are accountable directly yeah. to the voters every two years. And you know, it, it, this past session, it felt like things got a little nastier, mm -hmm. I think, because we were talking about reproductive rights. Yeah. Um, there's the, another piece to it, I think. Yeah. Uh, and especially Burlington's our biggest city. Right. And basically, the newspapers there are tabloids. Mm. And, and they act like tabloids now. Ah, uh, in and terms of looking, how they report the, and, how they and report and the they're news. They're looking mm. for what's more sensational than, you know, the reality is we passed a lot of good, good work. Oh We're my being gosh. looked at as leaders right. in some areas around the country. Right. And, and yet, the the media's take on it for a while was we were a do-nothing legislature. Right. And so, yeah, so let's name the elephant in the room. Yeah. We didn't get uh, the paid family leave bill through both chambers, yeah. and we didn't get uh, the minimum wage bill through both chambers. Yeah. We each got those through, Yeah. and we will get them through. Right. And that, I mean, Jill Kerensky, the House Majority Le yeah. Leader, and I have met several times. That's going to happen. Yeah. But that became the story. Yeah. You couldn't get it done. And what I would encourage people to really think about is, to your point, is what you're reading in Digger or Seven Days or wherever you're getting, or even on or the, free press. Or the, or the free press, is that the whole story? Yeah. There have been numerous times when I've gotten emails from people locally who got the story wrong about what we'd done. And I'd say, oh, no, 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 no. I know what yeah. you're basing it on. Let me tell you what happened in committee. Let me tell you what wasn't in that article. And so 
I don't want to say to trust us rich writ large, right? We are, yeah. we have to be but accountable, us. but ask us, please yeah. don't assume yeah. malevolence yeah. because we are not, um, we're not part of a machine no. here in Vermont. And, we're, and we can do more, for instance, right here to get the word out. Absolutely. And, and how we share it uh, back home. That's up to us as well. Right, um, right. But we're here. And so thank you for that yeah. perspective. And, and thank you for your service. Um, you've been a great addition thank you. to the county caucus uh, and a great addition to leadership. We, we have both House and Senate, I, I think, a very effective, uh, hardworking leadership team. And that's why Vermont continues to be looked at. Again, I was talking to a, a legislator from Oregon. Oh yeah. yeah, we look to Vermont all the time yeah. when we want to do something. Yeah, because so. we're thinking we're thinking broadly and long term. We are. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for your service there. And speaking of getting in touch with people, if yes. people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do it? So the best way to do it is to reach me through email, B Ballant, only one L, B B A L I N T at ledge dot state dot V T. US. You can call my home number and it will give you another number that is just for legislative calls. Yeah. And I don't have that number memorized yeah. yet. <laughs> but we yes. will we'll show that up on the board that would be when, great. They, when they do the post-production. That would be here. great. They, I'll get that to you. Work for us. Um, because as we said, the, the work continues. Yeah. I love meeting with constituents. Yeah. It's, a, it's one of my favorite parts of my job. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's a great place to live, and we want to keep it that it way. Is. Yes. So, thank so, you, Mike. So thank yeah. you, and and thank you to BCTV uh, once again. You help us do our work here, and and we appreciate that you're having your struggles here too. Right. Uh, there are some things happening right. nationwide that uh, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit sure. before we before we leave. Sure. I, and I meant to mention that that earlier. So um, we um, are in a situation where. Um, the public access TV stations all around Vermont may lose a considerable amount of funding because of uh, an FCC rule that may go through. And so I am chairing a, a committee that was formed through um, actually the broadband bill that was passed. We set up a work group to really bring together all the stakeholders who want to make sure that public access TV is viable long term in Vermont. We know that so many of our constituents get information from BCTV. It's incredible how many people will stop me on the street and say, I saw that interview or I saw that yep. uh, select board meeting. And so we, I, I can't overstate it. And that's not just true for Wyndham County. And so we're trying to come up with, whether it's um, statutory language that is gonna, gonna help these, um, these various outlets around the state or whether it's a different funding stream, but um, we also are taking public comment every time we have a meeting, and you can go to the um, legislative web page to the work group page on public access TV. You can decide that you want to come up to Montpelier and testify. We yeah. have four more meetings, I think. So, yeah. Yeah. so we're working on it. We want BCTV and all the people here to know uh, we appreciate what you do here. You help disseminate this information to people locally and, and we're, we're working to, to help keep this going. Absolutely. So thank you thank and you. thanks for tuning in. Bye bye. Now.